Hello, and welcome to Toastmasters in the Community. I'm your host, Fran Okeson, and I'd like to thank my crew for coming in today. It's the last show of 2017, and we hope you enjoy these shows when they appear on television. We appear on the first, uh, the Saturdays, uh, we tape on the first Saturday of every month, and we're on every Saturday at 7 o'clock on Channel 34, Spectrum and Fios. If you're interested in learning more about Toastmasters, my email and telephone number are at the end of the tape. Just give me a call, preferably use my email, and we'll get you started. With me today, I have Linda Isaacs, who just gave me some good news. She's going to join our No Limits Club after today's meeting, and I want to welcome you as the newest member of No Limits Toastmasters, Linda. Oh, thank you. And thank you. I'm sure that you'll have a happy time with us. And what is your other club, My Mile Square? Mile Square Toastmasters in Hoboken, New Jersey. We meet on Monday nights. You're always welcome to come by if you're in Hoboken. Very good. And Paul Paradise is the one who brought you. Is that who you're putting down as your sponsor? I'm sure that would be fine. That, mm -hmm. that would be very nice. Thank you very much. It's always nice when somebody brings a new member to the club. And thank you very much for Paul for bringing Linda to us. I'd like to start by giving my opening speech. I was doing, planning something else, but I want to tell you something that happened yesterday on Staten Island and that made me change my speech and I'll do my speech that I was going to do now. I'll do that next month. Yesterday was the 18th anniversary of the Cask Senior Poetry Contest on Staten Island. Cask is the Community Agency for Senior Citizens. It's run, this poetry contest is run by our good friend George Hopkins, who's been on the show several times. George is a mystery writer who recently came back to the Staten Island Toastmasters Club. He is now working on his seventh mystery novel. They're excellent books. I have to sit and read it in one sitting because it, it's so intriguing and I get so involved that I can't put it down. I went to it a couple of years ago. I missed it last year, although I put poems in those two years. But I, I get flits of information, of inspiration. And I know I just spoke there, but that's all right. I don't sit down and say, I want to write a poem. I can't do that. But if some idea gets into my head, you know, I'm usually cuddling one of my cats and I'll start just writing. Something came to me a few months ago and I thought, wow, maybe, maybe I'll enter with this one. And I sent my thing off, I guess in June, I sent my poem off, figuring, oh, well, I'm a senior. Why not do something and add to the fun of the day? So my son decided he was going to take me there. And I said, well, there's usually a lot of people, so let's take the role later, because I can't stand that long. And I was I glad I, I went. So let me tell you what happened. Every year when you are a poet, poet, <laughs> my sister Rita Claire would die if she heard I was using the fact that I was a poet. But every poet gets one of these books made up with all the poems that were given that year. I just checked now. There were 105 entries this year, and they did announce that 84 poets arrived yesterday at the Old Bermuda Inn on Arthur Kill Road on Staten Island. It's owned by John Vincent Scalia, a local funeral director, who's been donating the property for many, many years. I sat there and I wasn't looking for any thing. I just thought, enjoy. I, there were some people I know from Toastmasters, neighborhood people. One of my roofers always puts a poem in. And he was not there yesterday because he was having heart problems and he was in a hospital. So one of his friends came in and did it for him. Another man, it was really amusing because seniors, you know, we're a funny bunch of people. Another man got up and he said, I was asked to read a poem, so-and-so passed away recently, and he was a prolific writer, so I chose this one. And he stood there and he said, but I'll be back next year. I'm not the poet, but he left me his 200 plus poems. And I figured, wow, he's going to be alive for a long time if he wants to go through all of those. So I sat there, well, first of all, in the lobby, we had about a half an hour wait. Peter dropped me off and went home, came back later on. And I met this lady who was in a wheelchair, and we just sort of bonded. We bonded off across a few feet, and then I wheeled myself over to her. She was with her husband, and we got to talking, and yes, she said she enjoys writing poetry. 
just because that's what, and she had medical problems, of course. I was surprised to see so many people being wheeled in by wheelchairs and whatever. But as things came to about, I'm going to tell you that they gave out many, many, many awards to maybe make people realize that there's not just one winner in a thing like this. And I was sitting here listening to all the names and applauding like everybody else until they were talking about. And now we're going to the reflections category. And second place winner, Fran Okerson. And I think, oh my Lord. See, before that, they asked us if we wanted to go up and read your poem. And I shrugged that off the last time. And this time I was determined to read it whether I was got it or not. All right. So I'd like to read it to you and just recommend for people on Staten Island, look into this for next year. I called it Legacy, and it goes like this. When I was young, I thought old age was very far away. I looked at people as we passed each other along my way. Old age was so far down the road of life, it seemed the path for me might be full of strife. What was I supposed to do to validate my life? Would someone explain the purpose of my life to me? Who would show me the way, or did I have to find it on my own? Perhaps I should live each day as if it were my last. With that thought, I set out to enrich my mind, enhance my heart, and embrace others I met along life's way. Would this be the way for me? Now that I am nearing the end of the road that was set out for me so long ago, I wonder, have I done what I was supposed to do? Did I accomplish anything that changed the world? Perhaps that wasn't the plan that was set out for me. I must reflect now on what, I'm not sure. I'll keep thinking about my legacy to the world and hope I have time to complete what my God has set out for me. Until then, have patience with me. Growing old is a gift, and I have things to do before I leave. And I, I'm not shaking now. Yesterday, I was trembling up at that microphone, and they gave you a mic in your hand. It was so heavy, and I figured, I'm making a fool out of myself. And then when they printed it in the book, they didn't space it the way I did. So I was very glad that forethought I made my own copy and took it with me because I liked the way I had that spaced out. But anyway, people on Staten Island, CASC has a wonderful thing called Senior Poetry Contest. Next year will be the 19th year of it, and I suggest that you all spend this year, write a poem, put it in. Everybody gets recognized, and everyone is applauded. And that's my, in fact, I even, I never win door prizes. I was the first door prize ticket. And a woman came over because she knew I wasn't going to get up and walk. And she brought me this thing, and it's a quote by Abraham Lincoln. And in the end, it is not the years in your life that count. It's the life in your years, Abraham Lincoln. So I'm thrilled to pieces. I had a wonderful day yesterday, thanks to the Community Agency for Senior Citizens on Staten Island. And that's my speech. Thank you very much. And now we'll move on. We have a very interesting speaker up now. Our past first District 83 Governor, Paul Scharf. And Paul's doing communicating on the internet, instructing on the internet. And in five minutes, Paul, and this causes for a team of evaluators. Joan, that's, if you look at the clock here, it's two minutes for the four evaluators. I am one today. And to Paul's, let's see. All right, the evaluators are Kevin Thompson, Linda Isaacs, Lucy Kahn, and myself. And we each have one thing that we're focusing on, on the evaluation sheets. Each one of us is doing a different focus. And the title is Email and Word from the Bottom Up. Let's all welcome past District Governor and current Area 42 Director, Paul Scharf. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. Email and Word from the Bottom Up sounds interesting. How many of you have sent out an email and you forgot to put the attachment on. Uh-huh, everybody seems to raise their hand. I guess that's a habit. How many of you send out an email and you forget something important and then you have to send a second email that says, and by the way, blah, blah. Some of you have raised your hand on that. I'd like to give you a system that I use which appears to work pretty well. There's seven steps to an email in my mind. The first step, write the message. 
type in the message in your email. That's the very first thing you do when you pull up a blank email to send out. First, write the message. Second, reread the message and read it, don't laugh, from the bottom up. Read each sentence from the bottom up. When you read each sentence from the bottom up, you will find at least two things. One, a misspelling, and two, the sentence that doesn't sound right. Correct it. After you do that, attach the document if you're attaching anything. That's the next step. Attach the document. After you've attached the document, then go to the subject and write in on the subject line what the subject is. After you write the subject, then and only then do you put the email address of the person you're sending it to or copies if you're sending it to more than one person or a blind copy if you're sending anything to a blind person. <laughs> that doesn't sound right. Uh, a blind copy. If you do this, as I think, as I say from the bottom up, that email will go out the first time and go out correctly. Uh, one of the last things you do is do a double spell check just to make sure. And then, of course, the last thing is to hit the send button. When you're writing a Word document, it's almost the same thing as when you send an email. When you write a Word document, write up the document and then read it from the bottom up. Believe me, you will find mistakes that you didn't know were there. So read from the bottom up on that Word document before you do whatever you're going to do with that document. So email and Word from the bottom up, it works. You will look much better. The people receiving it will feel a lot better that they're getting a corrected email or a correct email or a correct document. From the bottom up, it works. Adam Toastmaster. Thank you very much, Paul. Very well done. Thank you. All right, moving right along. Our next speaker is Ken Raftery. And Ken, I did want to let everybody know that you have extra time on your hands this year because you're on sabbatical from Brooklyn Tech, where you, a, let's see, it's, is it an advanced calculus course or just a regular calculus course? Advanced that, placement. Advanced placement. Okay, very good. So, Ken, I'll let you talk about, let's see what you're doing first of all. You're working on your vocal variety speech. Oh, very good. And Jay Sukmanen is going to be your evaluator. And I do have your pictures here, and Peter has the photos up on the drive. And your title is Breaking the Language Barrier. Let's all welcome Professor, soon to be, Ken Raftery. Can two people who don't speak the same language become friends? Well, Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and viewers, I can tell you firsthand that the answer is yes. And the twist to the story is that I was the person who didn't know the country's language. Now, let me back up a bit. I've been more than a fan of pro wrestling for 33 years. It's really a part of my life, and as most Toastmasters know, three WWE Hall of Famers are beloved friends of mine, but that's a story for another time. So I was on Facebook a few years ago, and I saw some classic pictures of some of my favorite wrestling stars. So I became Facebook friends with a person who posted them. His name is Haru. I said, where did you get these great pictures? He said, oh, they're from Japan. That's where I live. So we chat over Messenger from time to time. People who share the passion for wrestling can become instant friends. Now, there used to be a wrestling promotion in Japan that was popular for decades, and I was a big fan. But they went out of business in 2005. But a few months ago, I heard that they were doing a reunion show. 
they were bringing back all the stars from the past, and the ones that were still active would participate in wrestling matches. I asked Haru if he was aware of it. He said, yes, I'm going. I was thinking, should I go? He said, it's sold out. So I emailed someone from the promotion, and they said, it is sold out, but we have standing room, and we're holding a ticket in your name. Uh, what should I do here? This isn't exactly driving to Long Island. So I asked my friend Henrietta, who's like a real-life Auntie Mame, what she thought. And she said, I found in life that you're more likely to be angry at something you didn't do than at something you did do. So you know what? I decided I'm off to the land of the rising sun. Now there's one major twist to the story. Haru doesn't speak a word of English. I found out over the years that what he was doing was typing my messages into Google Translate. So when I met him in Tokyo, he had his iPad handy, and we were able to speak through the iPad translation. So the show was a lot of fun. He actually stood with me during the show. He said that it's a better perspective for taking pictures than the seat that he had bought. So after the show, I went out to dinner with him and his friends. And again, thanks to the magic of the iPad, we were able to have a nice conversation. Now, there's something that had been on my bucket list for quite a while. Bull Nakano is a legendary Japanese woman wrestler. She actually is a former WWE Women's Champion of over 20 years ago. But I had heard that she runs a bar in Tokyo. And the basic gist of it is, you pay 6,000 yen to get in. But once you're there, you can meet Bull and have a conversation with her. You could take a picture with her. And the entire bar is filled with wrestling memorabilia, even the bathrooms. I never had so much fun in a bathroom in my life. <laughs> so I thank God that Haru was there. I never would have found the place if not for him because you're dealing with a different language, so we were able to find it. He had been there before. So if we could show the photo, photo number one, that's me with Bull Nakano. Now take a look at the center. That's an image of Bull in her wrestling persona. See her with the, the hair up to there? So she looks quite a bit different now. So th that night I felt like I hit the jackpot because a guest bartender that night was Manami Toyota, if we could see the second picture. Some wrestling historians call Manami the greatest pro wrestler of all time, male or female. That's her on the left, that's Haru in the center. And if you look closely, you'll see the iPads on the bar because I had great conversations that night with people who didn't speak English, including Manami herself. And I should say that there's also unlimited draft beer if you go to the bar. <laughs> So if ever you're in Tokyo, I recommend it. Now, I had heard that a tradition in Japan is they give gifts to each other. So I'm glad I knew that because I had gotten Haru a gift, and he had one for me. He made up a photo book of all the photos that he took during the show. So I certainly will never forget the show because there's all these pictures that he took from the show. It's, it really was a trip I'll never forget. And it seems that my time is up, so I just have one more thing to say. Sayonara, <laughs> Madam Toastmaster. Thank you very much, Ken. Thank you. I'll tell you, you have some exciting life for a teacher. <clears throat> All right. Now we have a little different aspect. Linda, are you going over to? In a moment. Just In a moment. Go okay, ahead. just watch that you don't walk away with it. All right, so now we have Paul Paradise, who is going to be interviewing Linda Isaacs. He's working on speech number two. Excuse me back there. Speech number two from the Communicating on the Internet Advanced Manual, the interview speech. It's five minutes. Aida Murphy is a new guest evaluator today. Aida, just uh, let me give you your credentials a bit. You're an advanced communicator, Silver, an advanced, advanced leader, bronze, and a, oh, you're the Division B director. Very congratulations, and thank you for coming and joining us. And the title of Paul's speech is Making an Informed Medical Choice. 
Let's all welcome Paul Paradise and Linda Isaacs. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. Thank you. Well, thanks to modern medicine, a child born today, if he's a male, can expect to live to age, I think it's 76, and if he's a woman, if she's a woman, can expect to live to age 78. Uh, and again, these are all thanks to advances in modern medicine. The downside are people are beginning to question whether we're over-prescribing medicines and perhaps over-testing, and whether the, this, this is too expensive. So there's been a question whether, uh, by patients, whether uh, we're over doing over prescribing these. So to answer this, I invited Linda to come on to answer some of this. So first, Linda, could you give us a little bit about your background? I'm um, sure. I'm a graduate of Vanderbilt Medical School. I completed my training in internal medicine, and I'm certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine. Um, and part of why I'm happy to talk to you about all these things today is because I am a member of the American College of Physicians, which is the professional organization for internists like myself. And they've created something that can potentially help uh, patients to navigate uh, some of these issues. Mm. And what would you suggest to a patient if they came up and asked you, um, how, how, what, what would you recommend to a patient? Well, there's something called the Choosing Wisely campaign, um, and this is something that the American Board of Internal Medicine put together along with groups like Consumer Reports um, to help people have a way to find out more information about what is truly necessary and what isn't. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a place that you can go. It's choosingwisely.org, and you can go there and use their search engine to look and see more information about whatever testing um, that might be proposed for you. Mm -hmm. I, I had a chance to look at the, the website before I came on board. It's really wonderful. Uh, can you tell me some of the significant medical savings that this um, program has provided? Gosh, I wish I could give you dollar amounts off the top of my head. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a little okay. hard to measure in the sense that what they're really trying to do is encourage mostly physicians, since they're the ones ordering the tests, but also patients to understand that a lot of what was done historically wasn't really necessary. Mm -hmm. um, an example I could give you would be preoperative testing. Um, sometimes uh, hospitals mm -hmm. or operating rooms will insist on a whole battery of tests that may have been done early Earlier that year, for example, it's not necessary to repeat them, and yet they have their little check boxes, and that's how they operate. And these things, you know, again, for an individual patient, it might not be a lot of money, but when you multiply it by millions of operations across this country, it, it can start to add up into money. Okay. Do uh, you remember what the five questions for the Choosing Wisely campaign suggests for, that a patient asks? Um, well, uh, amongst them are, is this test really necessary? Mm -hmm. um, how is this going to change the management? In other words, what happens if I don't do anything? Mm -hmm. um, in other words, you know, as I was taught as a medical student that if a test isn't going to change what you recommend to a patient, then there's no real reason to do the test. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the kind of question that the Choosing Wisely campaign encourages patients to ask. Mm. Very, very good. Um, now, American medicine generally has been criticized as, as having too many medical tests. Is this unique just to the United States, or how do we compare with, say, with other countries? Generally speaking, on that kind of topic, we compare very, very badly. Um, and it's partly blamed on our fee for, for service, service. Um, because, you know, the reality is that doctors get paid for doing things, not for thinking. I, I hate mm. to say it, but that is the truth. Um, and so uh, no one gets sued for not doing a test. You're, I mean, for doing a test, you're more likely to get sued for not doing one. Mm -hmm. So market forces uh, and patient fears and the doctor fears can all uh, contribute to excessive medical testing. Mm -hmm. Would you like to say anything about certain tests, let's say the uh, PSA test? You think that's overprescribed? Um, the PSA test is very uh, controversial because there's not a whole lot of evidence that finding prostate cancer early, especially in older men, really saves lives or, or helps people. What it's more likely to do is find a problem that never would have bothered the patient during their lifespan. So that is definitely a topic that I would encourage the audience to review and understand thoroughly before getting that test. Okay, thank you very much, Linda. All right, thank you, Paul. All right. Thank you, Paul and Linda. That was very, very interesting.
Very nicely done. Mm. Okay. And now our next speaker is Jay Suknanen. And Jay, you were up before. You're an advanced communicator, bronze and CL. And I hope by the next time you come on the show, you'll have your next accreditations and you can keep moving forward. You're doing speech number five in the Persuasive Speaking Advanced Manual. This is the Persuasive Leader. Joan, he gets six minutes, please. The evaluator is Ken Raftery. And your title is so easy, my purpose. So I hope it's going to be my purpose in life because I almost said that there because it just sort of flows. So let's see what your purpose is, Jay. My purpose. My purpose is to get the world to join together to end suffering and to save the planet from our own destruction. In this, uh, in my purpose, I want to make sure we end people being hungry. I want to provide food, water, shelter, also further that to health care and education. In this, in, through my networks and the things I do throughout my life and the other endeavors, I plan to accumulate a certain amount of wealth to help provide these services. Also, working with other people and having networks to do this. Through my life, I want to motivate the young, those that give up on themselves, and anyone else I may motivate. Ultimately, I want to be able to take care of my family and my friends. I'm working to shift people's mindset, right? I want everyone to see that we have enough. If you take a moment right now, you know, you, you're sitting here or you're watching this TV station, you could see that you have food, you have clothing, you have shelter. All these things make a big difference. So I'm working to shift people's mindset to be grateful for what they have. We have so much, and sometimes we, we say we're grateful, but when do we really take time to practice gratitude? Do you set aside time daily in the morning or night, maybe when you're praying for some people, and really getting into practice gratitude? The way I do it is I have these beads, and there's 108 of them. And every night, I would say I'm grateful for something on each one. Right? And that's just to remind myself to be grateful. Every day, I do something in the morning as well to remind myself to be grateful. But when you realize to be grateful, you get what you want in your life. You see more positive things, and you find out what you really want, and it, becomes, it starts manifesting in your life. That is one of the reasons I wrote this book, Abundance, A Journey from Anxiety and Depression. It's to support people in the shift of mindset, showing them that we do have enough, also aligning them with their purpose, and whatever they may need to succeed, it has tools to carry on while maintaining your well-being on your journey of life. Because most people struggle down the line due to health, right? So you want to maintain yourself and don't overwork yourself. Through pursuing my purpose, my purpose has become more directed. I see more ways I could contribute and help the world. As I further myself down towards my path and my dreams, my vision becomes broader and I see more ways I can interact and it just becomes more fun. And I see my dreams coming into reality. I find ways I could contribute and different goals that I'm hitting are fulfilling my purpose as well. So I would like for all of us to, if you guys could join me on a session to, uh, through a vision. If you could just close your eyes, take, take a few deep breaths. So you inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. So I want you to imagine. Imagine that you're in the slums of an impoverished neighborhood where there's shacks that are falling apart. There's places where there are no shacks that there should be. And there's men and women and kids walking around with rags for clothes, barely anything covering them, bones protruding their skin. You could see they're hungry and thirsty. And they're just looking for food even in the dirt. They're just looking to find some kind of scrap. And yet we could come in. And we could bring something different. We could offer them 
food, water, shelter, clothing, temporarily, right, to get them on their feet. We get the government to allow us to work on their land. And we then have the own people that live there build their own community. So on this, they would be working on taking care of their own community, smiling, laughing, building up their nation, their community. Instead of becoming a burden, there will be a contribution, a contribution to themselves and the world. The reason I am able to construct my purpose is because I believe in oneness, and I see we're all connected. And when I realize we're all connected, I realize I have access to all the resources. And the only thing blocking us from getting access to those resources is asking for the right reasons, and also understanding that we have to enroll other people into our vision. And by enrolling others in your vision, the vision will turn out and you just got to be a part of it. You don't have to control it, just let it happen. If that's what your goal is, let it, let it come to fruition. This can all happen if we support the world and world peace. Remembering peace resides within us. So we have to come in, be in the now, realize we have enough, and come from a place of peace. And we all have the opportunity to transcend this world. Thank you, Thank you very, very much, Jay. Very, very nice speech. OK. And Linda, you're up again, but you do this one sitting down. <laughs> all right. Linda is doing speech number two from the basic manual. That's one thing I did want to point out, that when people finish the first manual and go into the 15 advanced manuals, they can always come back and redo the manuals over and over. Sometimes they find new ways of doing the speeches to, than they did it the first time through. This is Organize Your Speech, Having an Opening Body and Conclusion. Joan Marizio is your evaluator. And your title is The Science of Selling Toastmasters. Let's all welcome Dr. Linda Isaacs. Thank you. As a physician, you probably don't think of me as somebody who's trying to sell something. You might think of salesmen or saleswomen as people who are selling cars or clothing or something like that. But actually, as a physician, I'm trying to sell people on the concept that they need to take care of them, their health. I need to try to convince them of that. And so, um, so part of what I do sometimes is read books on sales. And so this particular book is called The Science of Selling. And during this speech, I'm going to give you some of the principles that are mentioned in this book, which emphasizes that you need to, uh, to figure out what the buyer's needs are, to answer some basic questions in the buyer's mind. And I'm going to talk about it in the context of selling Toastmasters. So the first question that your buyer would have is, why should they change? Why should they do anything different from what they're doing? And there you'd want to present a problem and also present the pain they're having from that problem. Failure to effectively communicate can affect every area of our life, whether it be giving a presentation at work, which Toastmasters can definitely help you with, but it, it, Toastmasters can also help you express yourself in the rest of life. And failure to communicate effectively can have all kinds of negative consequences of not getting what you need or want from family, friends, your boss, etc. So I think there's a good reason to improve one's communication skills. Why do it now? That's the next question. Why should you wait? Um, again, every day that you're not effectively communicating is a day you feel those consequences. So the sooner you change, the better. The next question as a salesperson you need to get your buyer to think about is why should they use your particular solution? Um, you as the audience might be thinking, well, why should I join Toastmasters? Maybe I'll just buy a book on public speaking or communication and put it into practice as best I can on my own. And the answer to that is that Toastmasters has a long track record of helping people learn to effectively communicate. Um, so why reinvent the wheel? Why not come and learn from other people, get their feedback, um, and be able to gain from other people's experience? So there's a good reason to not try to do it on your own and to come to a place with proven expertise. Then the final question your buyer might have, or you as the audience might have, is why should I spend the money? 
um, every dime you spend in one area, you can't spend on something else. But Toastmasters is actually an extremely effective, uh, cost-effective way to improve your speaking skills. Yeah. I know when I first thought about improving mine, um, which I did because I wanted to be able, if I was asked to speak at a conference, to say yes with confidence, I actually went and took a public speaking class at the local adult education thing that was put on by the Hoboken Community Board, uh, the Board of Education. And I, I, I spent more for that class than I did in my first year of Toastmasters. And the first thing out of the instructor's mouth was, you all should join Toastmasters. Mm -hmm. So I decided that that would be a much more effective way to, to <gasps> advance in public speaking. So those are the kinds of questions that a buyer might have in their mind if they're they're trying if you're trying to sell them something. This is the kind of question that the book can help you establish about whatever it is that you're trying to sell. But what I'd like to try to sell you on is you should go and find a Toastmasters club and investigate what it can do for you. Madam Toastmaster? Oh, very very nice. What a nice pitch for Toastmasters <laughs> there. <laughs> That's very very good. We had a man join our Richmond County Club a years ago who had taken the Dale Carnegie course. And he stopped, he came to us, but then they begged him to come back and be one of their instructors, so we lost him as a <laughs> member. <laughs> very, very nice man. I met him several years later. He was still a very happy camper. Uh, what are we up to now? Evaluations. Oh, Imogene, you have the pleasure of evaluating me. Yes, I do. <laughs> we had a little tete a tete over the lunch break hour. And uh, Imogene doesn't remember what she said about my <laughs> dropping something at one of the conferences, but she said, I said, well, I remember it like it was yesterday. I so Imogene, what did you think about what happened to me yesterday? I thought it was wonderful. Madam Toastmaster, <laughs> Linda, studio audience, and of course the TV community. I really did enjoy your presentation. It's been years since I've heard you talk, except for when I was here in July. Prior to that, it was quite some time. As usual, you always present us with such knowledge, and you have such warmth in your presentation. And I always walk away from your presentations thinking, gee, that gives me an idea for a speech. However, what, I'm going to put your speech into this category. I know it concentrates on visuals, on the general to the specific. The general being, which was the correct thing to do. You gave us a background on this particular contest that it's just for seniors. And that, was, was, that intrigued me right away. And you gave the guidelines, how long it's been in existence, which is quite some time, I believe 19 years. 18 this year. 18 yeah. years? Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. And the fact that you presented a speech is, is absolutely wonderful. That's very daring, but you are a daring person, and I'm proud of you for doing that. <laughs> However, I, I also think that reading your speech added, it was a very nice touch that you added. It was a personal touch, and we n know more. I would say we can gather some thoughts about you, perhaps that we didn't know, by you giving that presentation, it was almost like telling a story. The one suspense that I perhaps I think you almost forgot was your own. What was the award? Because my, my hesitation when you were giving the presentation was, well, what was the award, Fran? And she did present that award, a very lovely award. Now, the specific, she also, prior to that, showed, showed the book. So it shows you the volume of poems that are in that book. And then she opened it up later on. So I thought it was a great presentation. Thank you again, and congratulations Imogene, on your award. Please stay there. That was one of the door prizes. This was in the book, and I forgot to show it. That oh, was the, that was the, that's that, was the that was the award. That was the award. Oh, but that's I put nice, in the book though. so it wouldn't bend. Okay. But it was, yes, second place in the reflection category. Okay, great. Thank you. I knew but, I had my you props. You should be proud. We're proud of you. Thank you very much, You're Imogene. Welcome. You're sweet. The reason I chose to read my poem now is that I shook so much yesterday in front of that huge audience. I actually was shaking my hands, the, pa the paper was flipping, and I wanted to test it out to see if I could read it today without, but see, I'm with Toastmasters today, and I'm used to Toastmasters, so I wasn't shaking at all. But 
Now I know how people feel when they say, I almost died. You know? <laughs> if I compete next year, I'll have to ask you to come just in case I win. You can hold my hand when I'm there and have a doctor in the house. I don't think my doctor makes house calls like that. Hello, Kevin. Hello, friend. We're seeing an awful lot of each other today. Oh, oh, you're part of this team. That's right. I wrote my results. Please, the four people on Paul's evaluation team, please make sure he gets his paper. And all right, so it was communicating on television, on the internet. That's the new manual instructing in the internet. Kevin, you're doing part, which part did I give you? Number? Number one. All right, why don't you just read the essence or just tell the answer because it's just basic. We have to watch the time. What was your main focus? Fellow Toastmasters, welcome guests, and of course, Paul. So this is the evaluation guide for instructing on the internet. And my role was, what were the objectives of the training program and how effectively did the speaker fulfill the objectives? And it reads here, the note to the, on, to the evaluator. In this project, the speaker is to present a training program on how to prepare and present a speech. So that, in my mind, was the objective. I think that there was a disconnect because that's not what Paul was talking about. He was talking about presentation of an email. Now his presentation of that email speech was right on fantastic and I would not recommend anything else. But in terms of meeting that objective of preparing for a speech, I think that there was a disconnect. So either Paul was thinking one thing or, and I was thinking something else. Madam Toastmaster. Thank you very much. And who had number two, please? Let's say. All right, Linda, if you'll <laughs> go ahead with your part and tell the folks what you were looking for. Okay. I was inspired enough to try to do my evaluation from the bottom up. Um, <laughs> Paul gave us a clear and useful way to write and proofread an email or document. Before he started, he elicited from us that we had common problems that his methods could help solve. And yes, absolutely, the program met the needs of the audience. It certainly met the needs of this audience member, and I plan to implement what he said in future emails and documents. Thank you very much. And Lucy Kahn, would you please tell us yours? Hello, fellow Toastmasters, viewing audience, especially Paul. I just want to make sure that the training, you talk about training program organ, is clearly organized, but I think uh, you're just giving us the seven steps of how to have the email, showing an email from bottom up. So it's a great speech, and I learn now that I can send an email with the correct way of doing it, and I can send it to everyone with no mistakes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. I took the last role, and my part was to uh, tell the speaker if he appeared relaxed, confident, poised, and to pay more attention to how he related to the camera, and did he have any mannerisms that took away from the speech. And I said, Paul, where is Paul? Oh, is that there. All right, Paul, I thought you were much more relaxed during this speech than I've seen you in a very long time. You were right on the ball. You knew exactly where you wanted to go. I didn't have to concern myself with any of those other questions. I thought you related extremely well to the camera. I was focusing on the camera throughout your speech because that was my goal. And I liked your gestures. You had gestures that emphasized your points, but you weren't flailing your arms all over the place. And I thought what I really liked was right at the end, you put your arms down and you related totally to the camera kept your body perfectly still, and I thought the presentation ended on a very positive note. And I'll give Linda my paper so when she turns hers in, she can turn mine in as well. And thank you, evaluators. I thought that was a fun speech to evaluate. Okay, are we ready to move on, please? Ken Raftery is the next speaker. And Jay Sukman, and I'll get used to your name, Jay. You're going to be the evaluator for breaking the language barrier. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Good so, afternoon. Breaking the Language Barrier spoke by Ken Rafferty. Great speech is vocal variety we're, we're looking for. I felt he had good organization. He stood up here, he looked very professional in his attire. I feel all these things affect your speech. He had great eye contact with the audience. 
good volume, good pitching quality. Uh, he had pictures of his loved ones as well. Uh, body language, we weren't really focusing on that, but he, he, was, he was very firm up here as well. His volume did project. He had good pitch, good pauses, good expressiveness. He always had a smile, so very welcoming and engaging to the audience. Good lineup, good. He had a good flow through the whole situation, and he stood behind this lantern and held his poise very well. For any feedback I would give to him is to maybe take some more pauses and some more breaths. He could switch his um, volume ever so often. And all in all, he's a great speaker, and I'd love to see him speak again. Thank you. Thank you. I'll have to come back to Staten Island to see that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jay. And now we'll have Joan come up and evaluate Linda's speech, The Science of Selling Toastmasters. That's an interesting title for that book, too. Um, what, did I miss actually, somebody? yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. Ada. Uh, it's Aida. I think it's... Is, is it Aida or... Aida. Aida. Yeah, I thought it was... I'm sorry. I'm, I'm really... Oh, well. All right, so you're evaluating. You're both newcomers to our show, so it's very nice to have you with us today. And why don't you tell us what you thought of Jay's speech about my purpose? Aida Murphy. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and especially Paul. Paul, you were the host of the interview program that we had today on making an informed choice. And you prepared very well for the interview today. And primarily, you had good questions. That is what makes a good interview, is you have good questions. You started off by framing the importance of the interview. It's a topic that we all are involved with, is our own medical choice. And you, you gave some background on why we should pay attention to the interview. One suggestion I have, Paul, is that you could have introduced the guest yourself rather than asking your guest to give her own credentials. I think it would become, have more credibility coming from the host about, the, about her credentials as a medical doctor and a graduate of Vanderbilt University. One of the best things you did was you had good, op you started off with a good open-ended question. What would you recommend you ask to your guest? And then you followed up with a specific question about recommending the five questions. You elicited the information necessary for a good exchange of information, and that made it a very useful interview. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aida. And now we'll ask Joan to come back. Is it Joan next? No, it's uh, Ken Raftery. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry. You know, I'm all over the place here. Yeah, no, I have it right here. It's just um, yeah. um, okay. Zero. Okay. I'm sorry. We'll get to the end of the program sooner mm -hmm. or later. Okay, Ken, now would you tell us what you thought about Jay's My Purpose? Yes. Thank you, Fran, fellow Toastmasters and viewers. Yes, I'm evaluating My Purpose, which was from the persuasive leader. I very much enjoyed this speech. It was the first time I ever heard Jay speak. And he conveyed his vision and mission very clearly. And as an author of a book, he's certainly a credible source of information. He made us a part of the vision. Having us close our eyes, I thought that was a great idea. It certainly forced all of us to be an active participant in the speech. Stories and anecdotes, definitely. You gave us food for thought. And I liked your stories about being grateful. It's very true how many of us really think about it. It's something we take for granted. And the beads, I thought that was a great idea. We, I think we should all do something like that. And then they ask about gestures, very good gestures. I like when you said peace resides within us, like you used your hands to enhance that. Did you convince us? Yes. And we could all benefit from this vision. I actually heard a Thanksgiving sermon with a very similar idea to what you were talking about. What did the speaker do well? Again, it was a powerful vision. You were calm. You didn't hesitate even once during the speech. And the title was a great idea. Like you very frequently said, my purpose, my purpose, my purpose. And just for a suggestion for improvement, I thought maybe you could like start with a question 
and just to get us involved from like the very first seconds. And I also thought your ending was like a bit sudden. It's kind of like, you know, some songs kind of tell you that the ending is coming. They slow down maybe a little bit. So maybe in your last few words, just slow down so we're aware, okay, this is like the ending. I know I myself was, wasn't sure. But other than that, I really much enjoyed it, and I hope to see you here again. Thank you very much, Ken. Thank you. And now we'll finally get Joan up there. <laughs> Thank you, Joan. Greetings, dynamic duo up at the front table. <laughs> Instead of circling, I thought it was appropriate to give her all star shiny kind of little symbols around her. Because I gave a five in everything. The speech value, preparation, organization, opening, body, conclusion, and the transitions were all smooth. They want to know how she could have improved it, except for maybe a song and a dance added to it. I don't know how, so I didn't answer that at all. But what I liked about the presentation is I said, you tackle this like a news reporter. A news reporter gets the investigation going, gets all the questions answered, and leaves nothing of mystery to the person reading the report. So I have to say I, I appreciate exactly what you said about medicine. I think if you were in charge of giving out opioids, we would never have had the trouble we're having today. It's a runaway issue now, and I think if you were there to guide them, it'd be great. You're a fantastic doctor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joan. Now let's go into the table topic section. And Imogene will ask you to come back up. You're doing a lot of walking today. Look at all that exercise you're getting today. Yes, indeed. Yes. <laughs> Imogene. And I did this to give you a chance to give your opinion of one of your purposes in life. You've worked for the North Shore Animal League for so many years. Please tell our guests and home viewers how easy it is to adopt a pet and give it a loving home in the new year. Imogene James. Thank you, Fran. I would truthfully like for you to think it's easy to adopt an animal. It is easy if you love animals. You must have patience, though, because so many of the animals that we have have either been abused or were found outside or somebody dropped them off at our location. So we, spill, we feel very honored to be able to help these animals, but we also want to make sure they don't end up in the same predicament where they came from. So believe it or not, and I've never been through the process, but I understand it's quite rigorous. I know that they call some, two or three people to ask if you know the person and what do you think about them adopting an animal, and there are other questions that they ask because, as I said, we really want them to go to a home. And so they come. Believe it or not, we have a quality control team that does spur investigations. They go to the location and see how the animal is doing. How's the animal being treated? And one of the things that we require is that the animal does not live outside. And that's one of the things that we always have to look for. Most people end up very happy, and we get so many accolades saying it's the greatest pet they've ever had. And we're glad to hear that because we want the animal to be happy, and we want them to know that we've done our best to get them into a home in which they love. Madam Toastmaster. Thank you very much, E.J. All right, Isaac. Where is Isaac? Isaac is here. Isaac okay. is always here. I'm watching the time, so... If you had an appointment with a doctor, very quick answer now, I'm looking at the clock, and I don't want you to yell at me. If you had an appointment with a doctor or other professional, and you knew there would be a long wait, how would you spend your time if you didn't feel like talking to anyone who was sitting there? Isaac, Madam language. Table Topic Master, I'm going to yell at you anyway because it's three minutes and th uh, three I'm looking, seconds. That's why I said make it. I will read. I love to read. I read a lot. I read in two languages, Russian and English, and reading is my passion, one of my passions. Uh, other passions, it's a different speech. So I will read. Thank, Thank you. you, Madam Table Thank you very much. Jay? Jay, very, very quick answer. I saw a movie about two weeks ago called The Starry Christmas from 2014. And one of the phrases in there was, anything is possible at Christmas. What do you think about the statement, very quickly? Anything is possible at Christmas? I already received Christmas gifts already. I'm getting, you know, good checks in the mail and good gifts from my family and friends. So anything is possible. You could, anything that's holding you back, you could get it right now. 
to go venture off whatever your dreams are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jay. <laughs> Paul? Paul Shaw. Okay. Paul, hi. I have an interesting question for you, Paul. What is your wish for the world in 2018? Paul Scharf, and take your full time if you need to, because I'm watching the clock. Madam Toastmaster, uh, my wish for the world for 2018 is to talk to everybody quietly and peacefully. Each one has their own religion. Each one comes from their own area, their own ethnic group, but we should talk quietly to each other. If we can talk to each other, we can get things done without having to relate to more rigorous things. The world's got to slow down. The world's got to be a little quieter, a little more relaxed. And that's my major wish for the world. Madam Toastmaster. Thank you very much, Paul. Linda, you and I have about a third of a minute. I wanted to compliment you and Paul on your presentation over there. It worked out beautifully. It really, truly did. I was very impressed by both of you. So what did you think about doing that, standing by? I, I was surprised that you handled it so well standing up. I usually have people sitting down doing that. I'm actually accustomed to speaking standing up, so I found it more comfortable to do that than to do the, the speech that I gave. Oh, okay. So I thought it was fine, and I think that there's plenty of cable here for uh, someone oh, doing that particular yourself? project. No, I, I kept okay. the lavalier on the whole time. Good, because usually they okay. don't like people to take anything off if they're not part of the crew, and we're just about out of time. All right, folks, we'll see you next year. Our next show. We'll be taping is January 6th, and we're on Channel 7, Channel 34 at 7 p.m. on Saturday. Okay. Okay. Oh, good Lord.